Okay, here we are. And uh, we get to take our tape off and our keel fillet is all hard. Yeah, good. And there we go. Nice job on that. Looks very, very clean and very true. Oh yes, perfectly true. Yeah, it's beautiful. I check it from the bow too. Um, although, as I said, this is not the time to check your work carefully, but it does look perfect. Okay, uh, check it carefully before the epoxy sets up. Now, we have the rudder to uh, rudder post to glue in this morning. Um, let's fit our rudder. We can find our rudder. Here it is. And there may be one. Our rudder post is in place, still taped in place. And um, let me turn this so I can see a little bit easier. And um, it's just at the front edge, it's pretty much flush with the bottom. At the back edge, it's sticking up maybe a 32nd of an inch um, above the bottom surface, which is just right. And. If we get our rudder in, we had a little bit of epoxy on that rudder or shaft, but not enough to mat matter. Um, and there's a little epoxy up, uh, I guess from our clear coating, a uh, little epoxy up against the um, top of the uh, rudder shaft there. Yeah, I can feel it there. So um, the best way to take that off is just with a mat knife. This is the Olfa type of uh, mat knife, O-L-F-A, I think I may have mentioned it earlier. Um, they are brilliant. Uh, much more control. You have this ratchet knob for adjusting the blade. And uh, it's also a break-off blade, but you can also sharpen the blade instead of breaking it off. And that lasts essentially forever. And um, so it's, it's a nice tool. Olfa, O-L-F-A. And so we can just cut this off. We don't want to scar the shaft at all because we want it to spin easily. And we are cutting, not cutting towards our fingers here because we don't like blood. We want the, uh, ideally, the rudder to slide all the way right up to the rudder tube. Um, and if you have any lip of epoxy around the shaft there, even the slightest bit, it would be nice to take that off. Now we can fit our rudder. Now, as I suspected, that, that's all the way in. And um, nice fit. But as I suspected, there's just a a little bit of rudder sticking out a little bit deeper than the uh, shoe on the rudder on the keel. And um, so if a weed is sliding along here, it's going to possibly catch on the end of the rudder. So um, so I am going to sand the, I'll mark first so I can tell. And then I'm going to sand the bottom of the rudder just that it's less than an eighth of an inch. But I want it to be exactly lined up with the bottom back edge bottom of the shoe um i think that mark shows well enough so um so the weeds won't catch and that may be maybe because i sanded the shoe a little bit more or something but um each build as i said will be you know, slightly different so just a quick sanding here should fix that That is almost perfect. I'll do just a teensy bit more. And yes, there we go. Now, nothing will catch on there. It's a very nice, smooth transition. Um, okay, so that's worthwhile. And the rudder uh, sits right nicely into that little uh, dish on the back end of the uh, 
keel shoe and still, but it's not such a deep uh, concavity that it, uh, it doesn't impede the rudder turning at all. So um, very nice details there. Let's uh, take a closer look at that so you can see it. So now the rudder lines up with the shoe so no weeds will stick there as they slide over the rudder. And there's this little concavity that the rudder is uh, riding in there at the back end of the shoe, which is sort of an extra detail, but it's rather a nice detail. So right, right on the back end of the shoe was, uh, that was turned into a slightly concave surface. Okay, so a couple of things you can do if you want to. Okay, and now... Um, let's just, uh, look on the inside and see where we're at and I think our rudder sleeve is a little bit high on the inside um, ideally it's going to be just an eighth of an inch there's a little C cut out, C shaped, uh, like the letter C, capital C shaped cut out on the uh, rudder support column. And the top of the rudder shaft wants to be just about an eighth of an inch above that cut out. So I think we might want to sand our rudder shaft down just a little bit. It's coming up just a little bit too high. I think we've got about a at least a sixteenth of an inch that we want to take off there. So we gotta get our tape to let go in there. So we can take our rudder shaft out. And the tape held on very well. Worked very well. <laughs> but now it's holding on too well. And then we will also rough up the outside of the rudder tube. So we get a better bond with the epoxy. Okay. And then we'll be ready. The goal right now is, uh, this morning, is to glue in the rudder tube. So uh, we will get this going here. It's just now the rudder's out of there. I can see a little bit better. So I'm going to put my rudder tube back in and get a sense of how much I want to take off there. So we're just up about an eighth of an inch above this bottom of that C-shaped cutout. So it looks like if I take off about a sixteenth, we should be good. So I'm going to be a little more precise. I'm going to wrap tape, blue tape, around the rudder at the right at the point I want to sand it off to. And uh, then I can just do it easily without having to refit it too many times. And you're sanding um, both the brass and the carbon fiber at this point. You could do this with a power sanding. Um, often you'll get better results sanding by hand though because power sanding it's awfully easy to take off more than you meant to. That was just what happened on my rudder initially, which is why I ended up doing the fill along the front to rebuild the rudder out there where I sanded off more than I meant, more than I wanted to, because I got lazy and did it on a power sander. Okay, let's try that, see what we think. Uh, dump that carbon fiber dust in the trash can. It's kind of, they'll get all over stuff. It's pretty black stuff. Yes, I think that looks just right. We're just up about an eighth of an inch above that bottom of the C-shape cutout. And, um, do a file. That brass tube down just a little bit, a little bit proud of the carbon fiber on the bottom end. 
And this is uh, like 100 grit or something. Yeah, this is 100 grit, but you could use your 120. Yeah. Okay, and that should be good. And then we want to sand the outside surface. Um, I'm going to sand a crust the grain of the carbon fiber. This is pultruded stuff, um, carbon fiber tube, and the fibers run parallel to the piece. So um, I'm going to try to sand that across the grain. Switch this piece that's already black. Sand this fairly thoroughly um, because the uh, Epoxy has trouble sticking to the shiny surface of the carbon fiber tube if it's not abraded. But once it's abraded, you get a very good bond. There we go. And we're ready. This is going to be a fairly small mix-up. I think uh, just one large mark. And um, so we'll be on the inside. Let's go back to using the stand. So what we're going to do is glue the tube in place with the rudder in the tube. And then we're I need it uh, lined up so I can sight from the back of the boat to make sure the rudder is perfectly lined up with the keel. Um, and so we're going to put the rudder in the tube and then we're going to slide the tube into the boat and then we're going to prop the rudder up from underneath um, so it doesn't want to keep dropping out. And the rudder will hold the tube up there. So we're going to get this set up first and then we'll take it out and put epoxy on everything. Now at this point we can do a little bit more adjusting. Um, I'm finding that my rudder tube is not quite all the way back against the rudder support column. And so I can adjust that. Um, it's a very slight difference but I can adjust that by filing the shoe on the keel just a little bit. Um, so I'll move this uh, groove forwards here at the back end of the shoe. Um, and I'll uh, let my rudder tube lie right against the rudder control shaft, uh, rudder um, support uh, column. Okay, now a few adjustments um, have made it so my rudder tube lies right against the face of the rudder support column. Uh, I did sand, uh, I think uh, there might have been a little little lump on the front edge of the rudder support column right in about halfway up. And I think the hole um, was a little far back and so I filed the front edge of the hole just enough that, uh, just a very little bit, but just enough that the um, it wasn't prying the uh, rudder tube out away from the rudder support column. And then I also um, put a little bit more of a concavity, concave surface on the back of the rudder shoe, which I like better anyway. Um, it sort of uh, keeps the rudder, sort of guides the bottom of the rudder, keeps the bottom of the rudder in alignment. And uh, But don't make that too deep or too narrow or else it may restrict the movement of the rudder. Um, the rudder should be able to turn easily, freely, 45 degrees each direction. Okay, now we're back to where we were before, uh, where we'll put the rudder in place, the rudder, tu rudder uh, tube and rudder together in place there. And remember the rudder tube is still supposed to come through the bottom of the boat, just um, flush at the front edge and maybe a sixteenth of an inch sticking out at the back edge. And we'll get onto our stand, keeping everything in place. And now the goal is to find a shim underneath the rudder that holds the rudder up 
in its perfect position. This may do it, a pad of uh, post-it notes. That's a little bit thin. So let's add a few more notes. Here's another pad of post-it notes. And that looks pretty darn good. Okay, so it's an even, uh, whatever you have, it's nice if it's an even thickness, not wedge shaped, because uh, then no matter how far you slide it in, it'll, it'll be exactly right. Okay, so um, that looks nice. And having that concavity at the back of the keel is kind of nice for positioning this. Um, it's going to come out angled right, no matter what we do. Actually, now, a couple more post-it notes, I think. This is actually pretty convenient. Because you can graduate your thickness very easily. Okay, that looks just right. The top of the rudder is right up against the bottom of the hull. So that's very nice. Okay. And on the inside, we look good. Um, okay, now... Uh, it's tempting to just do it this way, but we really do want to get some epoxy on the edges of the hole, on the inside edges of the hole. So we're going to have to remove our setup. Of course, when we re, if we move our boat around too much, our our shim under the rudder may change shape, may change size. But we we know we can get it uh, positioned so it'll work. Okay, and we'll do one large mark of pretty thickened and we'll have this done in a jiffy as uh, you know I can show you this uh, it does help as your epoxy gets lower in the container to uh, set the edge of the container one edge of the container up on something so the epoxy is deeper at the bottom corner okay so one large mark of epoxy and this one these are the orange tins are great. I'm going to use a new one because I'm actually going to heat this up as I mix it on a 100 watt incandescent light bulb if you can still buy those. And um, then it'll, because it's a small job. Uh, of course, if you get it too hot, it's going to set off in the pot before you can use it. Um, so it's, it's a matter of uh, sort of balancing act. Um, when it goes water thin as you stir it, the one large mark of, of pre-thickened resin and one small mark of hardener. Don't forget the hardener in your excitement here. And again, I'm going to pull in five marks and then just squeeze out one full mark, one small mark. And the rest goes back in the container. And lids on i think i made it i might have made that point earlier but if you just put the lid on loosely it's uh awfully easy we've done this to pick the container up by the lid the container will stick cling to the lid until it's about a foot off the table or off the you know uh, up above the carpet and then the container will let go and fall and land upside down usually um and so i'll mix this up uh over a light bulb and be back here in a minute. Now just another thought um, before we start spreading our epoxy around in there. Um, I think earlier we wiped off the um, sides of the rudder support column with uh, acetone or, or alcohol um, but uh, I don't think we wiped the bottom of the um, boat out because um, it wasn't part of what we were dealing with then. So let's use a little uh, acetone or alcohol or warm water just to make sure that we don't have an amine blush on the bottom of the boat where the rudder uh, support uh, column meets the hull and where the uh, rudder tube is going to be glued in with a bit of a, a uh, fillet around the bottom of the rudder tube to make it secure. So you don't want to have any amine blush you never know when amine blush has accumulated. Sometimes you can see it on the surface 
has sort of a uh, sort of an oily surface. Uh, if you rub your finger across it, you leave a streak. But um, sometimes you really can't see it. So wipe that off carefully. And um, probably a good idea just to see if you can get in there. I'm going to have to use a little piece of sandpaper here. Uh, I can't get in with the whole piece. Um, not a bad idea to see if you can get your fingers in there to braid that uh, bottom of the boat. There, yeah, just a little bit. That's, that's a bit tricky, actually. <laughs> Fingers are just... Okay, there we go. Just a few scrapes will um, give you better holding power. Now, probably with the 80 grit. A little difficult to reach in there, but it's probably worth trying. Yeah, <laughs> you have to have long fingers, so. I think that's going to do fine. Okay, and now, um, here's our epoxy. We're going to mix that up over the lamp. I'll show you that process, uh, just so you can see how I do it. And, um... It's a, an old lamp that has been incredibly useful. And my grandmother actually gave it to me for Christmas when I was about 10 years old. And I used it uh, studying, doing my homework. So it's just a, a pretty simple lamp with, I think I've got about a 100 watt incandescent bulb in there. And um, you're mixing this, so I just set the... Uh, pot right on top of the light bulb. This is one of the reasons uh, why I like these because they have metal bottoms and the metal heats up quite quickly. And you'll see that the epoxy goes quite liquid fairly quickly as it warms up. When it goes to a water consistency that's about when you have to stop because otherwise um, the next phase you'll see a little vapor coming off, a little like light smoke coming off the surface and then bang it's hard. <laughs> so You've lost it. Okay, so that's about... Let me just teens a bit more. Um, so the reason I'm doing this is uh, because I want to keep moving on the boat. And this, if I get this right, um, the uh, epoxy will set off in about uh, 35, 40, 45 minutes. So um, it expedites things quite a bit. So now I'm going to use the clear epoxy to coat everything. Coat inside the hole uh, for the rudder tube. Coat around the base of the rudder tube on the bottom of the boat. Coat the front edge of the rudder support column and the long, and about a quarter of an inch back along the sides of the rudder, rudder support column. Okay, and then I'll coat the uh, rudder tube I want to be careful not to get any epoxy up inside the rudder tube, though. So, uh, don't risk that. And... As far up the rudder tube... Remember, the very top of the rudder tube is not attached to anything, so it gives you a little surface area you can hold on to. And then, rudder back into the rudder tube. Actually, I'm going to put the rudder tube in from the top. Is the best chance of not getting any epoxy in it and the rudder in from the bottom. And again, make sure you don't don't get epoxy up in the tube. Okay, just cleaning off with a paper towel the bottom of the tube. Okay, and rudder. You know, here's a thought that probably is worthwhile if you have any paraffin. Uh, epoxy, um, when you don't want epoxy to stick to a metal surface, you can just rub the metal surface against a block of paraffin and the epoxy won't have a chance of sticking. So I'm just rubbing my rudder shaft on a block of paraffin. It's just, uh, you know, a candle works. Um, or this is uh, paraffin, I think, it's sold for canning, um, canning fruits and vegetables. Okay, now there's no chance that my epoxy, if I did get any epoxy up into the rudder 
tube, it won't be able to cling to the rudder shaft. Which will be nice. Keep the rudder tube down through the hole and then position your rudder on your shim. So the rudder sitting firmly on your shim and make sure your tube, the rudder tube is still down through the hole on the inside of the boat. Okay, and so far so good. True, true your rudder, straighten your rudder. Make sure it's lined up with the keel. If you did do that little uh, curved concavity in the back end of the uh, keel shoe, um, that should help keep your rudder straight and true. And good. Look at everything very carefully at this point, um, because this is how it's going to stay set up. Okay, and then add phenolic powder, about, that's about half a spoonful there. And you want, you definitely want a non-sag mixture, totally non-sag, because you're, um, otherwise you're going to end up with all your epoxy down at the bottom of the rudder shaft. So, uh, there we have a non-sag, it's just sitting there. Pretty nice, yeah. A little teensy bit of sag, but a really very, very little sag there. Now, uh, the most important part, of course, is down at the very bottom, uh, where the piece goes through the hull, uh, where the tube goes through the hull. And um, the trick is to work enough epoxy in behind the rudder tube, between the rudder tube and the rudder support column that there's no chance of leaking in there. So just kind of, if you have too thick a mixture, it's not going to work as well um, because it won't push in there. So just keep working it in from both sides between the rudder tube and the rudder support column there um, because you don't want any water to leak in there. And then start moving your fillet up the uh, sides of the rudder tube. So you're filling in between the rudder tube and the rudder support column. At the top, I'm going to bring my epoxy all the way around the front of the rudder tube. So I have a collar of epoxy around the front, all the way around the rudder tube, and back onto the sides of the rudder support column. And um, that way my rudder tube can never pull away from that rudder support column without breaking that collar of epoxy, which I would not, I don't think it will be able to do. But make sure you have epoxy filling all the way up both sides of the rudder support column, uh, just in case you didn't get a total seal at the bottom between the rudder support column and the rudder tube. You don't want any water coming in the boat and filling up. Okay, that looks good. And that's just the right amount of epoxy. Uh, you don't need any more than that. Um, actually, I'm going all the way around the rudder tube all the way up. That seems like a good approach. I have enough epoxy here. Um, and uh, there's very little epoxy left. I can get a little bit more on my brush here. Um, but that pretty much used exactly the amount I mixed up. Now if, if you have the right consistency, when you pull the brush away from the um, epoxy surface, there'll be a little barb of epoxy that pulls out with the brush, and with the right consistency, that barb will fade right back into the uh, surface and not leave a sharp barb. So um, that makes it much easier um, to get a smooth surface with your epoxy. If you have it too thick, if you put in too much phenolic powder, that sharp barb will stay elevated and sharp. And um, it's not quite as neat. I mean, it's still plenty strong and will work, but uh, it's not quite as neat and it's kind of a nuisance to have to sand those uh, barbs um, smooth. So getting the right mixture makes epoxy work um, much, much easier. One other comment um, before we finally uh, check everything, the alignment. 
is uh, you may have noticed that we are using this um, chainsaw, round chainsaw file, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot on different jobs. There's no place where you couldn't really probably do the same uh, work with a piece of sandpaper rolled up tight. Uh, just a, you know, like a one inch piece of sandpaper and roll it up into a sh tight tube. Um, but these are, for the chainsaw files are really quite inexpensive. Um, they're just a couple of dollars. And uh, because when you're sharpening chainsaws, they get, these get dull quite quickly and you have to keep buying them. So um, the chainsaw file from a hardware store is a nice uh, addition to your tool repertoire. This one, I think we measured it, I'm looking for my ruler here. Um, well, we can compare it to drill bits. I think we measured it five thirty seconds inch, but um, you know that's they have them in all different sizes. It's a little bit more than five thirty seconds. Let's go up a little bit. Probably uh, maybe th uh, three sixteenths. Was that what it was? Yeah. Well, it's a little less than three sixteenths. Um, although either of those sizes would have worked fine. Um, it actually looks like it's 1164. I'm not sure they make 1164. So maybe they call it a, I'd say either 530 seconds or 316 would be, would be fine. Okay. Um, and you'll find that once you buy it, it'll be useful for all sorts of, all sorts of things. And it's a little bit, it's, it does more uh, finer work than a rat tail file. Rat tail files tend to be a coarser, much coarser file. And it can sometimes uh, abrade the wood too aggressively and split it out. So um, the chainsaw sharpening files are quite nice. Okay, and now the final check to make sure everything is lined up and true. Let's see from underneath. And that looks uh, absolutely right on the rudder lined up perfectly with the keel and um, I think we're in good shape we just need to let that set up and uh, we should be great we'll get a quick view from the side here so you can see what we've done you see the pad underneath the rudder holding the rudder up in place so it doesn't drop out and then let's take a quick look inside the boat at what we did, so you can see that as well. Okay, you see there's a nice fillet down at the bottom of the rudder tube, probably about three quarters of an inch or an inch in diameter. And then the um, epoxy comes all the way up the rudder tube. Uh, and in between the rudder tube and the rudder support column and around the front of the rudder tube. So very solid, um, very solid, very strong there in case the rudder gets bumped or uh, caught on anything. Okay, and you can see our rudder, our uh, propeller tube is well bedded with epoxy on the inside and um, you can see where we did have to uh, enlarge that hole in frame six uh, down a little bit, so it's a bit of a more of an oblong shape uh, than uh, round at this point. Um, but uh, different builds will require slightly different variation. Just as a slight afterthought, um, I did start to think, uh, what if the um, epoxy that you use is a little bit too runny and runs out underneath uh, the bottom of the boat and glues the rudder to the bottom of the boat. So as an afterthought, uh, it's a little hard to see because it's clear plastic, but I put a very thin piece of plastic uh, slid forwards between the rudder and the bottom of the boat right up to the rudder shaft. Another uh, way to take the same precaution would be to, um, before you start this process, to put a piece of blue tape um, in place of this right along the top edge of the rudder uh, up to the rudder shaft. And um, the rudder, as you move back, if you move 
back just an inch along the rudder, it no longer there's no longer any risk of it at, at gluing itself to the bottom of the boat. But I think we're um, I think you'd probably be fine without that precaution. But um, if you did use too too much of the liquid, more liquid epoxy before the before thickening it. Um, and have or didn't thicken your thickened epoxy enough, uh, that added precaution would be um, would be helpful. You don't want the top edge of the rudder to glue itself to the bottom of your boat. Okay, good. I think that covers the rudder installation. One last comment, um, because it's fairly cool in my shop here, uh, and I want to progress with. Uh, the next step as soon as I can. I've got a lamp, my same lamp, um, uh, warming up the epoxy uh, so it'll settle a bit faster uh, in place on the boat. If you warm up epoxy too much it'll go liquid and may run and sag too much. If uh, you warm it up even further it'll um, bubble and gas and you'll get sort of a foamy type uh, substance which doesn't have much strength so um, you have to be very very careful and very cautious if you um, start using a heat gun or anything on it it's probably not a good idea because it is so easy to get it to the point where it gets all bubbly and foamy and uh, sets off real quickly but it doesn't have any strength so um, but the uh, light bulb lamp uh, will speed it setting up and yet shouldn't cause any damage. Um, okay, so a uh, few tricks if you're working in a cooler shop. And a cooler shop does make some things easier because it gives you more working time um, to, to uh, get your epoxy in place. Okay, there we are. Okay, let's glue together some seats. Uh, I'll show you where the parts are. They're all in part uh, sheet part uh, number six. And um, we have the front seat and the back seat. We'll keep those parts separate so we don't get confused uh, about which is which. The um, part sheet six, uh, this is the top side of it. And the front seat is on the top left corner, this shape here. And then the other front seat parts are these two um, they're sort of like lazy, look a little bit like uh, snow boots or something, I guess. Um, and so we'll get those out. Of course, we'll clean up all the tabs and everything with sandpaper, as you have done before. And we can, you know, you can cut those out with a knife just popping the, um, popping the tabs, or you can carefully press them out. Support the wood on both sides as you press them out, though, so you don't break the piece. Um, Especially with these end ones, the end tabs. And then this uh, long half inch piece here. And then one more piece, which is back down in the bottom left. Uh, now if you're facing the sheet, bottom uh, looking at the sheet from the front, the bottom left hand corner. And that's right here. And uh, so those are the front seat parts. Now let's get out the back seat parts. These two pieces are already um, free. These are the main part of the back seat. The back seat is in two pieces, um, two sides, and they go together like so to form the entire back seat like that. I'm gonna put a separate pile of the back seat parts. And then um, these are the supports that go under the back seat to support it um, uh, on the when it's sitting on the, uh, and one of these for each side, when it uh, when the back seat is sitting on the uh, floorboards, these um, sit down on the floorboards. The seats are um, fit in very close, uh, tightly, and um, everything, but they are not glued in because we want to be able to take the floorboards out at some point, perhaps. Okay, uh, let's go back over those parts so we're not uh, so everyone's clear. So front seat is the seat part, the two uh, support seat supports that go like this on either side, and the back seat support which goes across the back of the seat, 
and then the seat stiffener which goes across in that way and then oh let's go over the uh, seat parts again just so you're clear uh, the front seat uh, here single piece you can pick out which side looks the best to you and then across the back of the front seat is the back seat support and then we have the um, seat supports that go further forwards here and here roughly we'll measure for those and then the seat stiffener that goes across um, part way back uh, about here or so and um, then uh, on the these are all the um, parts from part sh sheet six and on the back seat we have the two um, seat pieces and then we have the overlap uh, jointer there that will be cut because it has to um, be on either side of these seat supports that come in here and uh, out there and the other seat support on the other side comes in about here and so you can see that overlapping piece that little overlapping piece is going to conflict with these uh, seat pieces um, let's see that goes this way um, so uh, the uh, overlapping piece will be cut in the to allow for those pieces and there'll be a small piece of overlap on either side of the support pieces and we'll put one overlap piece on one side and the other overlap piece on the other side so the two pieces will kind of join together and sort of lock together in that way okay so back seat pieces keep them straight or else you get confused and glue the wrong thing on where um, now other parts um, out of the thinner plywood 0.050 we have the two um, seat edge pieces and these are vertical grain so they bend quite easily because they um, have to take quite a bit of a bend to wrap around the seat on the front seat they go from one edge of the seat to the other edge going down into the u-shape like so on the back seat it's different though on the back seat the edge pieces just go inside the u at the um, front edge of the seat and the um, on each side there are mahogany pieces that um, stick down and support the seat those are solid mahogany pieces we'll bring those out in a minute um, okay so uh, here's our front seat pile now the um, edge pieces are different lengths the, sh uh, the shorter ed edge piece goes on the front seat the longer edge piece if you use the longer edge piece on the front seat you won't have enough to do the back seat okay and this piece the longer piece will be cut in half exactly in half for the back seat because the back seats in two pieces okay so first you want to sand off your um, any of the tabs and get the pieces all smooth. I've sanded most of them already, um, but there are a few more pieces to sand off. So I'll get the rest of the pieces cleaned up and then we'll start to work. We're going to glue everything together with uh, dots of CA first and then when we get all the pieces assembled then we'll uh, come back and do all at once on the front seat and the back seat, both halves of the back seat uh, at the same time we'll do epoxy fillets, very small epoxy fillets using uh, one of our popsicle sticks, the tip of one of our popsicle sticks to get a nice smooth, uh, very small, tight fillet. Uh, not a lot of stress, uh, you know, on these pieces. Okay, um, so I'll get these sanded and get the CA ready and we'll be building seats. I've moved over a little bit uh, to a cleaner work area because um, the first step we're going to do is glue the edge strips on and we have to make sure there are no bumps or anything underneath our workpiece, um, underneath the front edge of the seat because that would make our edge piece not lie uh, exactly flush with the top of the seat. So the first thing is to choose the best side, uh, I like that side, uh, they're both good though, um, and place the, the top side, the best side down and then you'll need a ruler and uh, we're going to make marks uh, first a line across for this piece and then uh, lines across for these support pieces here and the first line is four and an eighth inches forwards um, or actually it's back from the front edge of the seat from the flat edge 
four and one eighth inches, the mark there, four and one eighth inches here, and then a line across there. And then the second line is going to be at five and five eighths inches. So that's just over half, five and five eighths. A mark here, and five and five eighths. And a mark here. Okay, I know if you're in Europe, that's challenging, or Canada. Um, however, I'm sure you'll figure it out. Um, and then a line straight across between those marks, uh, I'm jumping over the U shape, cut out, and there. So um, now we have these two pieces going on like so, and this piece going right across. Now this piece is uh, beveled, the ends are not square, if you notice. Um, and the boat uh, up here in the front slopes in um, the, towards the water line. So we want this piece to be uh, set on there correctly, beveled with the ends sloping in. It's a, it essentially goes all the way across, but it's a little bit short of the edges, so space it evenly in the middle. And then the back piece will go right across here with the wider edge against the seat, of course, because again the sides of the boat slant in towards the waterline. Okay, um, but we're going to start with the edge strip um, and on these pieces, if you just bend it really suddenly, you'll probably break it, even though it is fairly flexible. So it's a good idea to kind of warm it up with your fingers and just kind of massage it into that shape. Oh, before we start though, um, we're going to mark the middle of this piece so we can get it centered. And uh, so if you don't get it centered, you might run out and not have enough to go to each end. So it's nine and three quarters inches long, so we're at um, four and a half plus uh, three-eighths. So that's uh, four and seven-eighths. Okay, and that should be the center. And four and seven-eighths. Yes, exactly good. And then mark a center on your U-shape too. So, and that's if we move our ruler sideways just a little bit from the edge. It's six and a quarter, so that's three and one-eighth would be the center point. Okay, so now we know where to start. We're going to start in the center there. The last piece of the seat assemblies is the edge strip, which is the quarter inch um, piece of veneer, um, quarter inch uh, wide, and on the front seat it's 10 inches long, and on the back seat there are two pieces, each of which are 6 inches long, and these um, go right along the front edge, or the back edge, it's the back edge on the front seat, um, the back edge of the front seat, and on the front seat, the uh, piece goes from side to side, all the way from one edge of the seat down into the U and out all the way to the other edge. On the back seat, the pieces, uh, the veneer edge trim, just goes inside the U. Um, one piece on one side and one piece on the other side. And then there are mahogany end plates uh, at the flat ends of the back pieces. So a little bit different on the front seat from the back seat. Okay, and these will just um, bend into place. I've marked the center. Uh, this is a 10 inch piece, so I've marked five inches. And I marked the center on the uh, seat piece. This is on the bottom side of the seat now. And I've got a piece of uh, saran wrap down so the CA uh, won't stick to the table. Um, this is actually packaging shrink wrap, but that's the same as saran wrap. does just as well. And just gently bend this in. You don't want to snap it. And line up your marks, your center line marks, and have the piece down, the veneer down on the table, flat on the table. And get your center line, center line uh, marks aligned, and have the veneer touching at the center. It's going to help to have a little weight on the end pieces of the veneer to keep it flat. There we go. And um, then get your just a little dot of CA. You don't want to get CA all over. In fact, you might have taken off your lid before this 
It's going to be hard to hold at this point. Okay, we'll let that sit there. Okay. And uh, we don't want to get a lot of CA running uh, onto the top side of the seat where it might be visible. So just a little teensy dot of CA here. And then spritz it so you don't have to hold it forever. And let that set up. Just a few seconds after you spritz it. Okay, that should do. And now, whoops. Okay, so uh, I've got the center line marked on my uh, veneer. And we're going to bend that into place here. The ends are going to want to pop up on you when you have it in place. So it'll help to weight the ends a little bit there. Hold them down. Okay. And we're just going to use very small amounts of CA because we don't want it to run down on the front side where it's visible. And spritz that. Now, if you just uh, let this go, it's going to flip up and that CA won't hold it. So we've got to keep our, um, our weight up here. <laughs> it's a little fiddly, but you can get it. And um, if that's enough. And then let's do a second dot. For the second dot, make sure you push that piece right tight into the against the front edge of the seat. You don't want any gaps. That won't look good. So push it in tight and spritz it. Hopefully your fingers are on the opposite side from the CA so you're not going to become part of your boat. And uh, don't, don't let go too soon or else it's going to let go on you. And then I'm going to get the other side, that same place. I'm just, I just moved out about half an inch from the center now. And again, half an inch from the center. Make sure your veneer piece is down against the table. Then back to the first side. You have to work with this piece. You can't be too too aggressive with it. Um, or else you'll snap it. Okay, make sure everything's pressed flat against the table. The seat piece and the edge veneer. Make sure the edge veneer is not leaving a gap with the seat piece. Should be right tight against it. Okay, and then back to this side. And now, as you get the hang of it, you may be able to do two dots of CA, spaced half an inch apart. Just so you can hold it in tight there. Make sure it's flush down on the table, tight down on the table as well. Okay, and uh, I'm not too particular. The, the spritz, it's not like epoxy on your fingers, um, but I keep spritzing my fingers, so I'm gonna put on a glove on the hand I'm holding it with, see if it doesn't impede me uh, too much. Yeah, of course, if you start gluing your glove into the CA, that's not good. Okay, now that's probably the hardest part, that starting part. Now we're moving up, and this dot can be a little bit farther out, actually, because uh, there's not as much pressure for the CA to be holding now. And spritz that. You can see this would be a difficult job without the CA. Now as we come around this bend, we really can uh, pull it in and it'll stay tight against there. So we can skip, we're skipping almost to the end of the piece here for this next dot of CA. Right, the biggest problem is if you um, don't hold it long enough and the CA hasn't set and, and releases. And that's uh, partly temperature dependent. Um, if it's warmer, the CA, of course, uh, all chemical reactions happen faster 
in warmth and if it's warmer the CA will set up faster than it is uh, here in this temperature because this shop is really cool I'll put a little bit more a little farther in to keep the angle it wants to flip itself over a little bit okay well, I think you've got the idea we'll work along the other side and then we'll get the back pieces on and I'll show you how the how they turn out and uh, then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll be on to gluing the other pieces on uh, the plywood supports uh, pieces and then we'll do epoxy fillets on all of this so it's really strong oh, it might be helpful just to um, have a quick glimpse of doing the second uh, the back seats um, probably the biggest most the easiest easiest mistake on the back seats is to um, create two back seats that are identical um, you, you don't want that you need a mirror image of the two back seats uh, a starboard side and a port side so um, when we get ready to do the second one we're gonna have the first one lying right beside it and so we can make sure we don't make that mistake that would be the easiest mistake to make of course um, okay, now on the back seat piece it's a we give you it's a little bit longer than you need intentionally um, but the place to start is right on the uh, deepest part of the curve and see if you can get that tight with a dot of CA first and then the rest will follow I think starting at one end might be uh, a little bit more difficult so I'm starting right in the deepest part of the curve with that one dot of CA when that sets up then we'll move um, we'll get the short end uh, attached and then we'll move up the longer edge of the seat okay now this, we're going to put two more dots for the short end and again make sure everything is pressed down flat against the table uh, so the top surface of the seat what will be the top surface of the seat is um, is uh, flush with the top edge of the edge piece, the veneer edge piece. Now if you don't use enough CA you can get some piece places times when it releases or if you don't hold it enough um, that's okay just use more CA. <laughs> In fact, I, I just had the whole piece released there, so just hitting it again with CA. Once you get the uh, deepest part of the curve attached securely, the rest will follow pretty easily. That's the hard part, and then this long straight piece is going to be quite simple to do. Now I've done the hard part. Now one thing that helps, and this is not a good example, is um, to have light coming into your workpiece at the right angle. Um, all my light is coming, I'm working in a shadow here, and that's a real mistake. Um, because it's hard to see what you're doing. My light is coming from the front side, and I'm trying to see it from the back side. So um, I'm going to grab a lamp here in a minute, so I'm not working in the, the shadow, it's the shadow caused by the edge piece, the edge veneer piece. And so I can't really tell what I'm doing. So let's get a lamp and have some light. There, that'll make for much better results to have appropriate lighting. The real mistake to do your work in dark, sort of semi-darkness or in a shadow caused by your own body or by part of the workpiece, um, and then to look at it, inspect it later in bright light, you're going to see, you're going to see things you couldn't see when you were putting it together. You know, it might even be a good idea, even though uh, we haven't filmed it this way, 
might be a good idea to reverse the order of um, doing this and um, do these back seat pieces first and then the front seat piece because these back seat pieces are a little easier than the front seat piece. You see how the saran wrap peels off quite easily. That that's looks quite nice. I didn't get it totally tight inside the sharpest part of the curve, but it's, it's pretty tight. I think it'll work fine. Um, and now we can trim off the ends. Just with a matte knife or one of these Ulfa knives is nice. Just trim off the end flush. And I did that last dot of CA release, so I'm going to put a little bit more dot in there. And uh, we'll be doing an, an epoxy fillet on uh, these pieces. So um, the CA, the epoxy fillet will make it very strong. So the CA is just to hold it in place until we get the epoxy on there. Okay, and then you cut the other end off. This time I'll try to be more careful and not have it release. And there we go. And uh, then just a little sanding and you'll have a very attractive uh, edge piece there. Um, cleaned up. I wouldn't do uh, too aggressive sanding though until you have the epoxy fillet on um, because then the piece will be much stronger and stiffer and uh, you're not going to have problems at that point. Okay, so there you go. There's your little edge trim on the back seat pieces, piece, one of them, first one, and on the front piece, and on the front piece we haven't trimmed it yet, we can trim those corners off. It's fair amount of downward pressure. You can't really, you're not really sawing, you're just pushing down on it. It takes a sharp blade too. If your blade is too dull, you may not be successful with this approach. And there we go. And you just sand that any bit sticking over the very edge and just sand that flush. That was a little aggressive there. I got a teensy little split, but we'll just get a little CA on that. And spritz it. And then hold it together in place, and we'll be fine. Okay. Now we'll glue on... Maybe we'll do the uh, support piece first, and then the two little wings. Oh, uh... The support piece is actually this other piece. Um, there's a support piece here. We'll do that. Remember the ends are beveled to match the sides. And um, you get equal space at each end. About a sixteenth from each end. Maybe a teeny bit more. And a couple of dots of CA on that. I'm going to do six dots on this one. Well, actually, I can't get to the center very easily there, so we're going to do two on that side and one on the back side. So that's um, five dots. Uh, no, seven dots. While you're doing this, you want the the seat piece to be resting on a flat surface, so this piece will help hold everything flat and true. Okay, and then these uh, little snow boot shaped pieces. This one goes right up in here. And right on top of your line, centered on the line. We'll just do four dots here you want to sight directly from above so you're sure it's square 
Don't want to cant it off uh, forwards or back. Okay. And um, then we'll put the other snow boot on the other side, but now you know how to do that. And uh, this back piece, remember it's beveled uh, to fit the curve of getting narrower, this hole getting narrower. And it does not, it does not go onto the edge of the back, e the front edge of the uh, front seat. It actually sits on the on top of the plywood. Um, so we're gluing it down on top. And we're going to move it forward just enough that we can get dots of CA behind it. Not very far. It's supposed to be pretty much right at the edge, but we want a little dot of CA behind it as well. Just like a s less than a sixteenth of an inch forwards, really. You can see while I'm spritzing it, it's moving all around the place. I'm not holding it steady. Once you spritz it though, that's the time you want to then pay attention to holding it still and it's stable. Okay, and last piece. And there we have it. Our front piece is all set. Everything lined up true. Everything's square and it'll sit inside the boat just like so. Very nice. And now let's uh, go ahead with one of the backside pieces and then I'll let you do the second piece on your own. On the backside pieces, um, we need a line two and a quarter inches forwards from the back edge. Okay, we have the uh, back seat support piece. And that's just two and a quarter inches forwards from the back edge of the seat, the flat edge. And uh, we used four dots of CA on that, on that piece, uh, just to hold it until we get the epoxy fillets on. And now we can do our um, overlap joining pieces. And uh, so just put that in place and mark it so you'll know where to cut it. A number of ways to cut it. Um, a hobby saw I've got right here. You can also use, um, well here this is even easier. You can just, you can use a paper cutter or you can use um, garden shears, this type of thing. Um, so we're going to cut that right at our mark. And then we'll uh, put it about halfway over the edge. Um, so half of it is going to be glued on and half of it will be sticking over the edge. Um, however, we're going to wait till we have the epoxy mixed up to attach that with epoxy because it'll be a lot stronger. And the other piece will cut and it'll fit in here, but we're going to put it on the other side so the two pieces kind of lock together. If you see any splits in your um, edge trim, you can just touch those up with the CA and um, that'll hold it all. It'll keep it in good shape. Okay, um, so we've got that piece cut and this piece will go on the other side, but we can mark it. It'll be the same on the other side. Well, maybe we'll mark it when we get to the other side. Okay, so um, there we go. I'll get the other side done up, and then we'll be back with you um, to get some epoxy on these pieces. And that, and, oh, and then we'll have the front mahogany plates uh, up here uh, to support the front edge. And that'll be our back seats. Okay, we have the last pieces ready now. Uh, these are the mahogany end plates. And... Uh, we sand them smooth, and um, here are our uh, two uh, mirror image uh, back seat pieces. Um, hopefully you have something like this, not two of this one, or two of this one, and nothing to match it with. So remember, those are like the bird's, the bird's wings or something. They have to be symmetrical. But mirror images, and um, I haven't sanded them uh, yet, but they'll look very nice when they're sanded. And um, but now we can add the uh, end plates, 
Um, actually, if we add the end plates, let's go ahead and sand the surface because um, it's going to be harder to sand right up to the end plate when the end plate is on there. So, um, especially at this uh, front end of these seats, it'd be nice to get the sanding done now. So we'll get that sanded um, down right up, uh, well we'll sand the whole thing and um, then we'll come back and get that end plate on. Now we've got this piece, all, uh, these pieces almost all cleaned up and looking really nice and um, I think you probably, uh, we get a lot of questions about whether um, epoxy resin or the CA will show through um, if you don't sand it all off. Um, it's, it's the only only absolute answer is if, if you sand it all off, it won't show, show through. If you can't see it before you varnish, uh, it won't show through. Um, there's an awful lot of variables depending on the type of varnish, the temperature of the day when you put the CA on, the temperature of the day when you're doing your varnishing. Uh, those those affect how much the different uh, the materials sink into the wood and the amount they sink into the wood, uh, the more they sink in, the darker the wood uh, looks. And so it's really hard to give a clear answer. So it's best to just sand it till, it's, um, till you can't really see the CA. Um, then where the veneer is, um, where you clipped it off uh, with a knife, uh, you may have a little bit sticking out there. If you sand it away from where it's stuck on, it'll probably come off. So, um, you want to be very delicate with that. In fact, uh, it's easy to split it there. Um, but if you split it a little bit, just use a little CA and uh, stick it back together. Um, so uh, let's get that. I just uh, I did just get a teensy little split at the end of that piece. So we're going to put CA on the back side of it and get it back. Uh, and some of this work actually probably should be done after the epoxy is on there because the epoxy will be supporting this veneer. The um, epoxy fillet that we put on will support this veneer. So I would wait. Wait till the epoxy's on before you do much, much of the sanding. Because we'll do our fillet. Um, up almost as high as the piece of veneer runs. Oh, and on sanding the uh, CA off the surface, uh, the best way to do that is to use um, some sort of support underneath, like this uh, little piece of wood here, which, um, because if you're pushing down on the veneer edge at this stage, you're going to, uh, you're probably going to crack it. Um, so, sanding, I started with. Um, so you know, the other thing is, if you're using dull sandpaper, it's going to be a lot of work. I started with 100, 100 grit, um, and that worked pretty well. 120 would be fine. Um, it's kind of a big jump to go from 100 to 220 like this, but um, we'll have another chance to sand this a little bit later. So the big thing is, um, don't put it flat on the table with your uh, all the pressure of sanding on that thin veneer strip. Um, because uh, the veneer strip probably won't take that much pressure. Okay, so having some uh, some support underneath, so you're sitting right, the plywood is sitting right on your support, rather than having the veneer edge sitting on the table. And there we go. Okay, this cleaned up nicely. Now, um, the uh, mahogany end plates are, we're ready to glue those on. They go with the, um, this is the center of the boat, this is the outside edge of the boat. The mahogany end plates go with the, um, the raised part towards the outside edge of the boat and they glue um, right on the very front of the um, seat, like so, perpendicular to the seat. And um, just so you get a good fit, you do have to sand that uh, veneer back at the front edge if it's sticking out over the front edge or else you won't get a close fit on that end plate. 
So just gentle brushing. This is with 220 grit. That seems to be working a lot better though. Brushing with the coarser grit was hard on the hard on the edge of the veneer. Uh, tended to want to split it. Okay, so um, that's looking good there now. And this is looking very elegant, just like an Edwardian launch should look. For some of this trim could be left off, but um, it really does add a nice dimension to the project. And it's fun. Okay, there we go. Super. And those two pieces. I'm gonna wait. The veneer is still sticking out just a little bit extra here where the two pieces are supposed to join together. But I'm gonna wait till I have my epoxy fillets now supporting the veneer before I attack that. Okay, and then on these pieces, the measurement is 1 and 13 sixteenths. That's just short of uh, 1 and 7 eighths. 1 16th short of 1 and 7 eighths. So a little bit of a mark. Again, a sharp pencil. 1 and 13 sixteenths. And then a line across. We'll get one of these on together and then I'll put the second one on. Now that's the bottom edge of the seat. That line is marks the bottom edge of the seat. And remember the raised part goes out towards the edge because um, it sits under the combing and that holds the seat down. And the mahogany piece is flush on the outside edge but overhanging on the inside edge of the seat. Okay. And remember that line marks the bottom side of the of the seat. Okay, so we're going to be going like this and putting it on. Um, but this time we're going to spritz the uh, piece itself first. Again, have the light where you can where it's uh, shining on your work, not. Don't work in your own shadow. That's what I was just starting to do. So, um, right along the line and the CA. I'm going to put three, actually four dots of CA on here. And spritz it again. Then check to make sure it's uh, vertical. I mean, you could use a square here, but you might need a, another set of hands. Um, if you're good at sighting things, you should be able to get it vertical just by sighting it. Don't let go of it too soon, though. Okay. There we are. And that one is done. Nice. Okay. There's your... There's your back seat. I'll put it where you can see it. Um, and what else is there on that? Uh, we're going to do our epoxy fillets next. And then we'll do a little bit more sanding. Um, just fair things out. Oh, and we have to put on our um, overlapping piece. Um, one, the one piece on one side. And this little small piece uh, in front of the uh, support uh, on the other side. We'll do those with epoxy though. That'll be better than CA for this. Okay, so we'll be back in a minute and get the epoxy going. Oh, one more detail um, that I should have mentioned before, but uh, it's possible to do it afterwards just, as, just about as well. Um, it's nice to round the edges of the um, front plate on these seats. Um, and that can be done after it's glued on, um, but it's probably easier to do it before you before you glue this piece onto the seat. So I've done it on this one. This one has not been rounded yet. And you can sand the, the front side as well to uh, where it's ready to varnish. Um, so I'll round this, you know, after it's glued on. 
So, uh, but this one I rounded before I was glued on. It's probably a little simpler. Okay, now the fillets, I mix two large marks of clear epoxy with two small marks of pre-thickened. And um, then I added phenolic powder until I have a, a mixture that's relatively, it sags, but very slowly. Um, these are very small fillets, so a little bit of sag is fine there. Um, along the back side of the veneer though, um, the thin edge veneer on the edge of the seat, uh, bring it right up to the top edge of the veneer, your fillet, um, and coat the entire back side of the veneer to reinforce it. So you're making that veneer quite a bit stronger with the epoxy on the back side. So um, you're not only, the fillet is holding it in place, so it won't come unstuck, but it's also thickening, you know, essentially making the veneer much stronger. Um, because now you have a, a laminate that's epoxy and veneer. Okay, try not to get any epoxy on the front side though, it'd be a little hard to sand off there. And then on this um, here, you could just do these fillets with the brush, but uh, we'll go back over them with the popsicle stick. It'll clean it up a little bit. Now if you come down too far on your support pieces, um, especially as you get towards the middle, the epoxy is going to be visible, so, so be discreet with your epoxy on these pieces. So with the brush you're essentially placing the epoxy and then with the um, popsicle stick we'll do our fillet. And you can just use the second end of one of the other popsicle sticks we've already used. And you can poke the angle it up so um, you're poking into the corner if Lower angle will do a thicker fillet, but you don't need a very thick fillet on these. And on your fillet along the back side of the veneer, angle it so that you're keeping epoxy all the way to the top edge of the veneer to strengthen that edge. Okay, that's looking good. And then with the brush, I'm going to get some of this off the brush on this piece and then I'll use the brush to clean up along the edges of those fillets. Just the bottom side of the seat isn't very visible, but it's nice to have it clean and neat. Okay, so there's the first one done. And we'll set that aside and uh, I don't think you shouldn't have any questions. I'll go ahead and do this one after after uh, we finish the others. Oh, let's go ahead and get our overlap piece on. Um, that's pretty simple. Uh, spread the epoxy on the bottom of the seat, not on the overlap piece, because uh, and fairly thin because you don't want it to be squeezing out on the edge. Um, and then. We'll add the overlap piece. <laughs> the overlap piece should be sticking out about half halfway. Half of its width, like so. And um, I think that'll just cling right on there nicely enough without clamping. And um, so we're good there. And make sure you haven't got a whole lot squeezing out in what should be a clean joint there between the two seats. Okay, let me set that so we don't disrupt it. That's good. Okay, and then on the front piece, um, pretty much the same routine there. Uh, Keep your epoxy 
doesn't matter how much epoxy you get on the bottom of the seat, but any epoxy that comes down these support pieces is probably going to be visible if you get it down too far. And um, epoxy supporting your thin veneer along the edge of the seat, the front edge, the, no, less the back edge of the seat, on this, towards the stern of the boat, on the front seat. So have your epoxy come all the way up to protect that veneer on the back side. And if, if it's warm where you're working, you need to be quick with this. Or else you're going to find your epoxy's all set up. Also, as it, as it starts to set up, it just gets harder and harder to spread evenly. Uh, and it won't. It does this nice sagging into itself. So you don't end up with sharp barbs sticking off when it's just the right mixture. But as it starts to set up, you'll start getting it so it doesn't want to spread. It's not, not going to be creamy and smooth. It'll get sort of thick and thick and putty-like and hard to spread. So, uh, so part of the key is to work quickly on this step. If it really was warm, you could have mixed this as two batches, one large mark, and then used that amount um, one large mark of epoxy, clear resin, and uh, one small mark of hardener. Um, but since it's cool in my shop, I mixed two large marks of resin and two small marks of hardener. Now these front sort of support pieces um the uh I mean careful not to get much epoxy up the support piece, just the height of the fillet. And I'm I'm not being so careful about the bottom side of the of the seat, because nobody can see that. Okay, and then one more um large mark. Should finish it up, and um, we'll have it all done. Actually, maybe if yeah, maybe one and a half large marks. Um, again, using the clear resin with the hardener, and uh, then the phenolic powder mixed in. Okay, let's take a minute to talk about fitting the floorboards, um, and then uh, we'll proceed after we fit the floorboards. We'll proceed with the engine cover, um, and that'll be uh, 7E if you're doing the electric version. And uh, if you're doing the steam version, of course, you don't need an engine cover um, because steam engine sits there. Uh, so with the floorboards, now for the engine cover to sit down flat and flush, um, also for the floorboards, the front floorboards to sit down flat and flush, uh, if your floorboards are hitting the, the fillet along the edge and angled up a little bit uh, you'll find that that front it fits okay but you'll see there's a gap down at the bottom there um, well it's a little hard to see let's see if we can get lights not great in there there we go now you can see there's a little bit of a gap it's not a big problem but it's nicer if um, the floorboards down flat and the gap will disappear also if the floorboards are slightly peaked up there um, where the combing for the engine hatch is going to be, um, the engine hatch isn't going to fit down quite as nicely. It'll be a little bit of a gap in the center line there. Typically, you're going to have the uh, issue up in this area here and here, and not so, not probably in the back. Um, at least in my build, the back is sitting perfectly flat. It's just right in this area. So we're going to sand underneath side of the floorboards, and we'll bring them to see how much you need to sand off. Let's overlap them and get them down flat um, on both sides and uh, then that will give us an indication of how much to sand off. And these are overlapped by a, about a tenth of an inch, um, a little less than an eighth of an inch. So that means I should take off about a sixteenth on each of the outside edges. Uh, let's zoom out just a little bit. 
So, along from about here to the front, I'll aim at taking off about a sixteenth of an inch, and I'll also undercut it. I've started that on this piece here. Undercut it means sanding the bottom side to an angle. Um, so, uh, here we go. Sanding the bottom side to an angle. So it's going to fit against your fillet more smoothly. If there are any lumps on your fillet that stand out especially, you could sand those uh, a little bit more as well. But I've got my fillet pretty nicely sanded there. So I think I'll take most of it off on this, uh, on the bottom pieces, which is easy. The big thing is, you don't really want to take out uh, chunks on the bottom pieces. You just want to fair them out um, the whole length. You don't want to like sand aggressively in one place just to fit around a bump. Um, it'll look better and more graceful if you sand the whole thing. Now remember the front of the floorboard, it's a little hard to remember actually, the front of the floorboard is square. The front end, the forward end, is the square end and the uh, back end is the pointy end. Sort of like the opposite of a boat, it should be. But the floorboards are different. Okay, so, uh, so we've undercut that quite a bit and taken off a little bit because we kept sanding until the edge was starting to fade and disappear and then we'll do the same uh, we'll do the same on the other side as well and keep fitting it take off a little to get perfect fits uh, if you try to do it a perfect fit in one go uh, it usually doesn't work out as well uh, so take off a little bit fit it take off a little bit more fit it keep going until it fits perfectly just a little uh, taking off a little bit at a time Fitting it only takes a second. Okay, and then we'll get uh, the floorboards down and we'll start working putting together the engine cover. That'll be a sort of fun, quick, easy project. Okay, now we have our floorboards sitting flat. Um, on this, this, this is especially the uh, floor frame that, uh, that you want to pay attention to. They're sitting flat on that floor frame, so this is a flat surface crust here. At the back, they're sitting flat on these floor frames too. Although that that really wasn't an issue, even at the beginning at the back. So um, now our engine uh, box will fit on there nicely. So we'll proceed to working on that, and uh, all looking great, very very clean and very nice. Just a quick note: any of these wood pieces can change shape um, almost overnight, or in in less than overnight, a few hours. Um, based on moisture conditions and humidity and or dryness. So this piece is dished just a little bit. It's the end cap for uh, the back seat. It's curved up uh, just this way a little bit. That means that this side got too much moisture in it. It was probably lying flat on the table and this side was exposed to the air and the other side was uh, was not exposed to the air because it's the table. And so this side absorbed a little moisture uh, more than the other side and um, expanded, and when it expands it has to uh, push the piece into a curve. So um, a hair dryer, this piece, this piece is slightly expanded too. Um, a hair dryer or a heat gun uh, will change that shape back um, very quickly. Uh, just don't burn the wood. You're not trying to burn anything or start a campfire. Just um, use it somewhat discreetly and don't go too far. Um, because you get, you'll dish it the other way pretty quick. So what we're doing is taking the moisture out of this side by heating it up, and you could, I mean, conversely, you can dampen the other side, uh, or do them both if you want, but um, taking the moisture out is probably the easiest. This is just the medium setting, um, not the high setting on this. And um, it's starting to starting to work now. And that is getting pretty flat. That one's still a little dished. Um, so I'll go a little bit more, but I think you get the uh, you get the picture on these. Uh, sunlight works great too. Uh, just sitting them in the sun for a couple of minutes, and they'll flatten right out. Uh, with the curved side in the sunlight, the curved side upward, curved upward side in the heat. Um, to flatten them out. That one's almost almost right on now. Uh, almost square. Flat, rather. Okay, now we have our seats fitted nicely. Floorboards fitted nicely. And uh, back seat here. 
If there's a little bit of a gap at the very back of the back seat uh, before the 7AB bulkhead, uh, not to worry um, because that'll be you won't see that because the deck sits over that area. Okay, so um, looking very comfortable and uh, elegant. Good, just what we want. So on the back tab, you can see how the tab had to be cut at an angle and the fillet had to be uh, filed away. I think it's what I did, but sanding could work. And the same on the front tab as well. It had to be angled and each fillet um, on the mating side in here and here, each fillet had to be filed a little bit to allow it to all sit flat. Yeah, you don't want the fillets to be holding it at some kind of weird angle. Um, so it takes a little bit of fitting to get it just right. Uh, not difficult though. And so there we are. Now, some of these parts are kind of delicate, like that little tab on the back seat. Um, until it's once in the boat, it'll be safe. But um, I've broken that off twice now. Once by trying to trim it a little bit to a bit of an angle there in place. And uh, once by dropping it on the floor. Um, but both times, so uh, it's very easy to fix things like that with the CA, uh, virtually instant. Uh, just put a little uh, thin ridge of CA along the brake and spritzed it with uh, the accelerator and then stuck the part on and within five seconds it was back back together. So um, it doesn't require a lot of strength but if you're going to be dropping it and, and uh, trying to cut it in place um, you may have to do a little quick repair with the CA. Okay. Okay. Here are the engine uh, cover pieces. We're going to um, punch those out and sand the edges. And uh, for the electric version, they're in plate uh, uh, part sheet number 7E. And it's every part in here. Um, the two sides, the top, and the front and the back. Oh, let's see. Uh, this is the back and that's the... No, this is the back and that's the front. Sorry. Um, the um, Oh, one mistake that would be easy to make here is that in these parts, um, let's zoom in a little bit so you can see them better. In these parts, um, you might think that all the louvers are going to go together. Um, well, the side louvers and the uh, top louvers do go together, but the end louvers actually go on the front. Um, this is the back of the cover, and the back of the cover needs the um, end that has the cutout for the um, motor shaft coming out and the uh, universal joints. So this piece here with the U-shaped piece cut out in it is going to go at the back um, here. So uh, that would be, and this vent is for air to flow in and flow the length of the motor cover and out the out the back vent. Okay, so the side vents and the top vent all go towards the stern, right over the mount motor, around the mount motor, and the U-shaped cutout goes at the stern. It would be easy to think that this one went with the other vents, but this vented piece is the front of the motor case. Okay, just wanted to make sure that was clear because you don't want to get it together the wrong way. Okay, then when you have all the pieces sanded, um, let's start putting them together on the uh, sides, the, the vents, um, want to be towards the floor so that when it's installed that would be the right side up but since I'm gluing it onto the uh, top piece uh, it'll go like this because we want the air to flow in through those vents up along the side of the motor and out the top so uh, that's why those vents go towards the floor and um, this piece will line up exactly with the front and back edges and be flush with the outside edge of the top cover on the top cover, choose your best side, uh, the side you think is the most interesting or pretty. This has sort of a nice swirl to it. So I'll put that side so it's facing up. Well, this side's nice too. They're both pretty perfect. Okay, switch it. Okay, so we'll do it like this, and um, then we'll get this piece on with CA. I've sanded all the edges and all the fuzz off, and we're ready to go. So uh, I'll just uh, do this side while you're watching so you can see. You need good light to be able to line up the outside edge flush. Um, the more precise it is, the better it will turn out and look. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to do this whole side at once is probably a little bit difficult uh, because lining the whole thing up simultaneously, both ends and flush along the sides, is a lot of 
acreage to deal with. So what I'm going to do is get it positioned as closely as possible, but exactly precisely at this front edge. And I have the vents towards the, what will be the floor. And I'll do two dots of CA towards the front here. And perpendicular, of course. Usually you can sight perpendicular pretty accurately. If you need a square, definitely use a square. And flush with the outside edge. That's the, probably the most important. And flush at the front. Those are the most important things that we're really focusing on right here. And square, perpendicular. See? And hold it still. <laughs> And we can do a little bit of fitting here to see how we're doing on that piece. In fact, wouldn't hurt to put this piece in now. Let's do that. And that'll hold that uh, by adding this back piece. This is the piece with the U, remember? By adding the back piece in, get your light where you need it. By adding the back piece in, We'll keep that side piece exactly perpendicular. My side piece was leaning in just a little bit. It was pretty good though. Um, but just a little bit and this piece will push it out perpendicular before we finish attaching the side piece all the way along. The big trick is figuring out exactly how to hold these pieces so you can see um, the critical angles and such. Okay, I think we've got it there. Now again, I'm just going to do one corner first, um, give myself some time to line up the rest of it, although it has to be pretty well lined up for the first corner to be correct. So flush with the side piece, flush with the top piece. You can make sure it's pushed all the way sideways into the corner, uh, don't let it push out away from the corner. It's got to do it. Good. Okay, now we can go either along the rest of this uh, back piece. Let's go ahead and do that. And notice that the U is towards what will be the floor. This is upside down, of course, the motor case. So uh, don't get the U up towards the vent. It goes towards the floor. Okay, and we're going to do... Uh, the CA is just to hold it in place. We're going to do a little epoxy fillets in here, of course, uh, because the epoxy is always going to be a little bit stronger. But uh, the CA makes it easy to build. We can do this corner too at the same time. Try not to add your finger into the cabinet. Uh, in fact, it's good to move your fingers. <laughs> it's good to move your fingers during the process before this. <laughs> Just make sure that you're not adding yourself in. Because um, you, you have a f those few seconds before it really sets up hard to move your fingers. Once you once it's set up hard, if you're part of the mixture, you're, you're sort of stuck. Okay. And uh, now we'll... I think we can just nail the back, uh, the far end, and then we can check the middle, see how many more dots we need in the middle. Good place for reading glasses if you use them. Look from different angles to check the, that it's square. If you just look from one angle, it's hard to tell. So lean over it and Look from different sides if you can while you hold it. Although, you know, a square, is, a square is convenient. If you want to use a square, you can get it perfect. Um, or these pieces are square as long as you sanded them uh, correctly. And so you could use these pieces. Okay, and again, I think we'll add the end piece. Then, although we are pretty perfectly lined up there, I'll probably add a, one more dot in the center along that edge. 
If you have any chipping out on these pieces from uh, pulling them out of the panel, put the chipping out on the inside and not on the outside. And uh, then you'll never know. And again, we're just going to start with one corner. Because if you try to do it all the way across, it's awfully easy to have one side perfect and the other side, oops, not quite. Little teensy variations, you'll be able to sand everything flush, but you don't want to have to change the shape too much um, based on not having it quite as flush as it should have been. Make sure the piece is pushed all the way into the corner there, because otherwise, otherwise when you go to put the second side on, you won't, it won't fit. It'll be falling off the edge. Okay, now I think we can do our little dot here, and in the corner, and that seems to be holding itself just right. And there we have it, our little motor case. Um, and then we'll mix, uh, that's a fair amount of, I think one and a half um, marks of, uh, should we go with pre-thickened? Yeah, we'll go one and a half marks of pre-thickened, or one and a half marks of clear, we'll be fine. Let's do one and a half marks of clear with enough phenolic powder in it that's, uh, fairly non-sag and uh, we'll spread those. So one and a half large marks of clear with uh, enough phenolic powder that is not going to sag too much and we'll do the fillets with a popsicle stick all around. Once it's filleted then we'll sand the outside corners if there's any overlap. Okay, um, now we have our epoxy fillets in. Um, one technique that works quite nicely with the uh, fillets is, um, I'll show you, is to uh, clean up the fillets mostly with the popsicle stick just by sweeping along uh, the outside um, where the uh, stuff is pushed do your fillet once and then just keep going over it pushing the stuff from the outside edges back into the center and um, working it till you have and then one final sweep down the middle these are fairly tight fillets it doesn't take a lot of strength in here um, now the important thing though is uh, the um, cow the uh, support um, piece the quarter the uh, eighth inch by eighth inch cedar piece that this uh, sits on um, has to come up inside of it so we've done our fillets right up to the top edge here that's going to block that piece it'd be hard to sand that out so um, I'm going to take a little piece of veneer here uh, just a little end cut of veneer you could use the plywood but the veneer is probably even better and I'm going to scrape that wet epoxy out of those corners up so it's a little bit more than an eighth of an inch so I'm not even close to where that um, where that piece of uh, cedar comes so um, so that won't be conflicting otherwise you're going to have a problem there and uh, some epoxy will stay in the joint uh, you're going to be fine. Don't scrape your whole fillet out, but you'll be fine with just the very corner being clear. And then set that aside. We're going to get a little heat on that, and uh, I did heat it. I did heat the resin quite a bit um, before spreading it. Uh, be careful with that, or else you'll get it setting off before you can get your fillet made. And that one and a half large marks of clear and one and a half uh, small marks of hardener and then phenolic powder till it was a non-sag mixture um, 
worked out just the right amount. It was, turned out perfect. Good. So we'll let that set up and then we'll do our um, edge pieces around the motor, around the uh, motor um, opening in the uh, floorboards and uh, we'll get this, um, this step all finished and ready. Be ready to mount the motor soon. Just a last note on this uh, engine piece. All that epoxy setting up, uh, it's a good idea to set a uh, weight on top of it uh, and set it on a very flat surface so you make sure it glues up um, square um, and doesn't doesn't have a uh, uh, tendency to be a little bit warped. Uh, once it's once the epoxy set up hard, it should um, hold its shape perfectly. Okay, so uh, I changed changed plans. Uh, took the lamp off the inside and put the weight on it. Now I'll put the lamp above the weight, and that that should make it set off pretty quick too. Okay. Uh, we have our motor cabinet uh, assembled, and it has come out flat, although um, we did have to have it setting up with the epoxy. We had a bit of a twist to it, and so when it was setting up before the epoxy got hard, we set it across. Let's see if you can see this. We set it across. A, actually, we used a file, but anything thin would work, and we weighted it diagonally. It's going across, so the file is underneath it diagonally because we had the twist there. And we weighted it um, on the two di diametrically opposite corners. And uh, that was just enough weight, it's not a lot of weight, but it was just enough weight to straighten it out while the epoxy set up. So um, that's a technique that you can use. Once the epoxy is set up, it should pretty much stay stable. Um, so the trick is we had a little bit of twist one way, so while it was setting up, we created a more of a twist the other way, and um, it came out flat when when we released our weight, and the epoxy was hard. It came out sitting uh, quite flat. There's a, yeah, that's pretty darn flat actually. Yeah, pretty good. Okay, so there are some tricks to getting something flat if there's a bit of twist. That there must have been a slight twist to the top piece. And so we created a counter twist as it's set up, and that took care of it. Anyway, um, it's nice when it's sitting pretty flat. That, that is flat. Yeah, that's flat now. Um, okay, now remember the louvers go at the back end of the... Uh, at the back end, which is the end with the uh, cutout for the universal joint. So the louvers go at the back end. Um, the U-shape matches... The U-shape cut out in the back end of the motor cabinet matches this uh, long U-shape for the um, for the shaft. Okay, and now we want to position this correctly and make a pencil mark so um, the overlap at the front um, with the motor cabinet compared to the floor cut out is the same as the overlap at the back and just make a little pencil mark to indicate that corner and the same on this other side, just a little pencil mark. And you could measure, but you can probably, it's such a small overlap, you can probably eye it very accurately. Okay, so now we know where the motor cabinet should sit. And we have it correctly positioned. Remember the the back of the floorboards is pointed. That's the back end of the boat. Front end of the floorboards, the forward, the front of the boat, is uh, the floorboards are square across, uh, square across there, that's the front end. And the motor cabinet goes with louvers in the front end, right in the front panel, and then louvers uh, in the top and sides at the back of the motor cabinet, pointing towards the back end of the boat. It would be easy to get that flipped around and it would not be quite as, it would, you don't want to flip it around. Okay, now, uh, just from the scrap uh, pieces of um, separating the plywood uh, parts on sheet number six, we took a piece that was um, just under half an inch wide and um, cut it into shorter pieces. Nice to know exactly how long those pieces are, if I can find the ruler. We cut the, these pieces were three eighths of an inch wide and we cut them into, they're already three-eighths of an inch, just 
some of the strips from uh, from part number sheet number six. Uh, took them right out of here, I think. Um, so uh, they're three eighths of an inch wide, and then I cut them to one and three eighths inch long. So one and three eighths inches long. Now the way we're going to use these strips is kind of interesting. Oh, um, yeah, we also want to uh, have side marks. So we can align the cabinet exactly sideways. So side marks have to show, make them outside of where the cabinet will sit by just enough that they'll show on both sides. Those are going to be covered up. Let them move them out just a little teensy bit there. Okay, and the same in the front. Because um, what we're doing now is getting the, uh, we're getting ready to glue the flanges on the cedar flanges that hold the cabinet in position. Okay, try to have those lines equally far out. Okay, now we know the back marks and the side marks, front and back, and so we know where that cabinet is supposed to sit. What we're going to do is kind of tricky, but um, clever in a tricky way. We're going to um, have our cedar strips attached inside, held inside the cabinet and um, so they're sticking down almost half the width of the cedar strip below the cabinet and then we're going to put epoxy on the bottom edge of the cedar strips and set the cabinet in place and let that epoxy set up and then we're going to be able to pull the cabinet off the cedar strips because the cedar strips are just going to be held by these little wedges. In fact here you can see a little sample of what we're doing here. Um, we're going to glue the little wedge onto the inside of the cabinet and then the cedar strip will be held, the wedge will be pried away from the uh, inside of the cabinet and because it's just glued at the top end and that cedar strip will slide right under it and be sticking out below the cabinet. So when we glue the cedar strip on we will not be gluing the cabinet on by mistake. Um, the cedar strip is the flange that will be glued onto the edge of the um, opening in the floorboards. You see we've taped the floorboards together so essentially they're going to act as a single piece of material instead of being separate and, and they're carefully lined up so um, they're all aligned. So um, starting point is to cut your sheet of strip so it's exactly the length of the inside of your motor cabinet. Um, and we'll need one for each side of course. So let's cut those. You can cut them with a knife or these, these cutting shears, garden shears are actually quite nice and work quite easily or you could use a little hobby saw or hacksaw. Lots of ways to cut cedar strips. And we want two of them so let's cut a second one the same length. Okay, and don't mind saving that a little bit. Square the end up a bit. Okay, and those should fit right inside there. Great. Perfect. And we did keep our fillets. Remember we scraped the epoxy of the fillets out. Um, and that actually needs to be scraped out a quarter of an inch uh, deep to let these fit in. And we did get it out far enough down, so it's just right. Okay, now um, the next step is to glue our little wedges inside. And these are what will hold the cedar in place. And um, then later on we can just break these out. Uh, but if you glued the whole thing flat against the insides, um, it's not going to work. So we just need a very small dot of CA on the top end of these uh, little these are just kind of temporary wedges to hold things in place while we while we get it glued in so we put one little dot, don't put too much because it will spread out over the whole thing and then spritz it and then hold it in place there 
Uh, in fact, I'm going to move that. Don't put it over the louvers. I, I accidentally put it right over the louvers there. You don't really want it over the louvers because if it's not over the louvers and you end up leaving it in place, that's fine. Okay. You should do it. And uh, so we'll do four of these. Again, just use a very small amount of CA. If it pops off because you didn't use enough CA, that's not really a problem. Just put it back on with more CA. Okay. And they can stick out of, over it a little bit because the cedar, we're going to leave the cedar sticking out a little bit. Ah. Watch your fingers. Don't glue, don't glue yourself on. Remember that once you spritz it, that CA sits up pretty darn quick. So get it in place quickly. Placement of these doesn't really matter, just so it's not right on top of your louvers. Now that one I wasn't too happy with because I slid it. I put it against and slid it down into place by mistake. Uh, so I kind of would have glued it on all halfway down. It just want to be glued at one end a little bit. So don't slide it down into place because you'll spread the glue on up it. So let's try that one again. Inside the louvers this time. They can't stick out too far um, because the cedar strip isn't that wide. In fact, that one's a little far down. Uh, we chop it off. You have to cut against something. I'm cutting against the edge of the table there, and that did work. So now it's only sticking down about an eighth of an inch. You don't, don't have them sticking down more than an eighth of an inch because that's how much of the cedar is going to be underneath, uh, sticking out the bottom. Okay, the reason we want the cedar to be sticking out is so that when we glue the cedar on, if any epoxy escapes, it doesn't glue the motor cabinet permanently on. Okay, and it will be easier if they do stick down a little bit, because then you can use the part... Okay, now that one wasn't on there well enough, uh, and that may well happen. That's better than having it on there too, too tight. So, um, that's a good mistake. Um, so a little bit more CA on this one, and spritz, and get it right back in place there. In the meantime, we can work on the other side. All that sets up more. Now we pop another one off, so a little bit more CA on this one, and uh, put it back in place. You're kind of gradually approaching where what you the point you need to be at, which is where the piece will stay on, but where it's not on any stronger than it needs to be. It's not glued on more than at the tip. Okay, now we'll go back to the first side and get our piece in. A little fiddly to just pry it away just enough that you can get the cedar underneath it, but not break the piece off. Oh, we have multiple tries. You have plenty of CA. So I'm sure you'll get it. Okay. Another one came off. I think that was maybe the same one that keeps coming off. So let's do a little bit more CA. This time and spritz. This is, uh, you know, I want you to see that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, just because I'm doing it, it doesn't work perfectly every time for me either. Because you'll probably pop them off five times before you get it going. Okay, so now we'll wedge this under here. That, oh, we keep popping it off. Let's get that one back on. So each time we're putting a little bit more CA on, so it'll be a little stronger. But we don't want it to be glued up too far. 
Um, and then let's try to pry those apart holding the piece attached just a little bit so we can kind of urge them into the right position and then we'll put our piece in. Okay. Let's see if we can get it this time. Oh. Let's bend them a little bit first. Okay. Okay, now back to this side, see if we can get it finally. Okay, that one's almost in. Okay, so there, that works fine. Um, the second approach is probably a little easier for you. Uh, but let's go back to our first side and see if we can get it to work. Um, so the second approach was holding the cedar strip in place and then gluing that tab against the cedar strip to hold the cedar strip um, in place rather than gluing the tab on first and then prying it out for the cedar strip. Uh, although now this that seems to be working there and we'll see if we can get the second end in on this side. This is the other approach where we glue the tabs on first and then pried them out and that worked that time too. We had them glued on solidly enough that time. Now let's get this cedar strip so it's about half exposed. Oh now one of those did pop out so we'll do it the we'll do it the other way where we glue and hold. That was one that hadn't popped off before. Okay, a little spritz. And we'll do the glue and hold system. You have to squeeze it in tight with this system and hope your finger doesn't get glued on with it. Okay, so we'll have the cedar strip sticking down far enough that they should not get glued to the, uh, that the uh, motor cabinet should not get glued onto the floorboards at the same time. This is a little, you know, sort of a klutzy system, but uh, doesn't have to work perfectly the first time. You have plenty, plenty of tries. And the reason for not just gluing the strips on in the right position is it's hard to get them positioned exactly right, so you'll have a real tight fit between the motor cabinet and the strips. Whereas with this system, we know the motor cabinet and the strips will fit uh, just like a hand in a glove. So even though this is a little fiddly, getting these pieces glued on tight enough, uh, it's a pretty good system overall. Okay, now we have the strips in place. And uh, you can see how the strip is sticking down. Um, that showed better. Sticking down about half the width of the strip, about an eighth of an inch below the motor cabinet. So if we're careful, we should be able to glue it on quite nicely. Um, we've got our marks. Remember the marks are for the edge of the motor cabinet, not for the edge of the strips. The strips are inside the edge of the motor cabinet. Um, there we go. So it'll be just like that. So all we have to do now is coat our strips with epoxy and then weight it gently because otherwise we'll push those strips up in, inside the motor cabinet too far. Weight it gently and uh, let it set up and we'll have a perfect fit. Okay, and we have the louvers at the back end. Remember the back end is the pointy end, unlike a boat. And um, so we're set for our epoxy. Don't need very much. Um, but let's go ahead and do half a, half a large mark. That's probably excessive. And we use the pre-thickened um, because we don't want to run and sag all over the place. Okay, so half a large mark of epoxy and half a small mark of hardener. And again, we're going to pull in five small marks of hardener and then just squeeze out half a mark. Make sure it's a full half mark though, we don't want to have this not set up. In this case, there's not a whole lot of strength involved, so if you got a teensy bit of extra hardener, like two-thirds of a mark or something, um, 
that's not a real concern at all uh, it, because we're not really counting on a whole lot of strength here. And um, this time we're just going to use a little piece of um, the thin piece of the plywood to do our stirring and um, because we don't really need a brush for this small job. Now we don't want too thick a coating because otherwise it'll squeeze out all over the floorboards and look and not look quite as clean and neat. And again, there really isn't much strength involved. So a fairly fine coating here will do it fine. We'll do just right. And don't glue your cedar strip to your cabinet or to your tabs actually. Because the tabs <laughs> tabs now are probably glued fairly firmly to your cabinet. Oh, and uh, try not to spill on your deck, as I just did. Okay, we'll sand that off later. Um, better to work not on top of the deck at this point. So, here we are. Move the deck aside. And, uh, again, light is the order of the day here. I mean, it's light, but... You may still get a little uh, bit soaking in. Um, if you get any drips down going towards the motor cabinet, get them off first. Um, stop and get them cleaned off. Uh, just I'm using that edge of paper to get that drip away from the motor cabinet. I don't want to glue my cedar strips to the motor cabinet. Okay, so um, a little be, be alert to that happening. If you put this on like super thin, you know, just barely coated, the cedar is actually going to soak up a little bit of the epoxy. And you might end up with not enough epoxy. So it's kind of a balancing act between not wanting it to squeeze out all over the place, but not wanting it to all be soaked into the cedar and leave a dry joint that doesn't really, uh, where you don't have enough epoxy. Because we're just coating one side in this case, we're not coating the deck. It's, it'd be a little hard to get a clean edge on the deck. So um, here we go. That should do it. I don't know how well you can see. You can see a bit of the reflected light on the cedar edge there. Okay, and now this would be an easy time to stick on backwards, which might be okay, but because you could probably reverse it, but it might not be absolutely... It might not work as well to reverse it. Okay, and pencil marks, try not to skid it. You know, you want to put it down in the right place rather than skid it sideways after putting it down because you're trying to get the epoxy so it doesn't come out and be visible. Okay, now, this is a rather tricky point here. You want to weight it because otherwise it's not going to stay that flat. And we were careful to have the cedar strips, you know, evenly extending out beyond the edge of the cabinet on both sides and all the way along the length. Um, I'm guessing that... Uh, this will be the right amount of weight. Uh, if I used heavier weights, um, it would either push the motor cabinet down into the epoxy, or else it might um, pop the uh, pop the cedar pieces off, as we saw was pretty easy to do as well. So um, there we go. Uh, check the alignment. Looks good front and back. Um, our pencil marks are showing here. Pencil marks are lined up on the side with the outside edge of the motor cabinet, not with the cedar strips, but with the cabinet. So I'm looking straight down and seeing those marks lined up nicely. And I think we're... And you can make sure your U is lined up too. Your U-shaped cutout should be lined up with the U-shaped cutout in the floorboards. And there we go. I think we're ready to leave it for... till it sets up. And, uh... Yep, that looks very nice. Good. Okay. Um, nice system. A little fiddly uh, at first getting those cedar pieces on. 
but um, it's it really did work out pretty well as we expected. Okay, so it turned out that the um, I think the uh, sanding blocks were a little bit too much weight because I think one of the uh, cedar strips was sliding up inside the motor cabinet a little bit. So um, so I lifted it off, slid the cedar strip out just a little bit, and now I'm using the sanding blocks to weight the uh, to weight the bottom um, the the uh, floor pieces. And I'm using just a very moderate amount of weight on top of the cabinet now. Just this piece of wood and then a, uh, <laughs> just a small part of a roll of tape. So, um, so uh, don't weight the cabinet too heavily um, because it's going to slide down. It just slid down on one side, the other side didn't. But um, if it slides down into the epoxy, you're going to glue your cabinet on there permanently and there's no easy solution for that. So just a very very light amount of weight on the cabinet just to hold it down and uh, it's good to weight your floorboards so you can weight them more heavily to make sure the whole system stays flat as this epoxy sets up. Okay, so just uh, wanted to correct that. I thought those... I knew the metal weights that I sometimes use were too heavy. I thought these might be a little bit too heavy but um, I thought I'd try them anyway and it turned out they were too... they were too heavy. So, um, there we go. Looks good. And louvers are towards the back. The U-shaped cutouts are lined up perfectly. And, uh, everything looks really true and, and correct. And I can look underneath along the sides and I can see that my motor cabinet is free of the glistening epoxy. Uh, so, when we come back in the morning, the motor cabinet will not be glued down to the floorboards, so we're in good shape now. Okay, uh, this should be all set up, and you can see I added a little bit more weight. I thought there was a little teensy gap in that corner, so I put another, you know, few ounces on there, and I think that closed it up. So um, now let's see how it turned out. This is, uh, we'll just lift this off, and Hopefully we haven't glued the cabinet. No, it comes off real easily. Whoopsie, what's holding it there? Something holding it right in this corner. Ah, a little bit of epoxy. Ah, oh, the, uh, our tab got glued on there somehow. So not a problem. Okay, and let's try to see how that fits. Oh, we've got our tabs still in there. Um, but it should be a perfect fit. And, uh, so... Now we're ready to put our little cross pieces on, and that'll be easy. There are a couple ways you could do this. One way would be to um, have a single piece going across, but just glued to one side. The other way would be to cut it in half and glue half to each side. Um, in the back, of course, we just have little short pieces uh, because of the um, cutout for the shaft. So. Um, I think we'll do two short pieces in the in this end too. I think either way is about equally equally satisfactory. A nicer nicer cut there on that piece, um, and then we can mark it. Remember, this piece goes in between the two side pieces. I think we can mark it with a knife, right like that. sanding should make that perfect. And then we'll cut that in half and glue half to each side. There. And here. You don't want these to be holding the pieces up the floorboards apart, so uh, let's sand that just a teensy bit more. Good, and then a couple of those short pieces at the front, 
and we'll be ready. Now these pieces aren't terribly important. I think we'll just put them on with CA. Uh, that's so quick and easy. And we don't have to wait for epoxy to set up. Okay, I think we're ready for a little CA and we'll have this finished and ready to go back in the boat. Once you spritz it, you only have a few seconds. Okay, I think you got the point. Uh, we'll go ahead and CA the rest of the pieces on. And um, then we'll put our floorboards back in the boat. And um, put the engine cover on. And uh, the next step we'll be doing in just a minute here is... Uh, putting the trim. We'll sand the engine cover. Uh, I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, there's a little bit of overhang there. I'll sand that flush. Um, but overall it looks very nice. And then we'll put our mahogany veneer trim on the engine cover to dress it up. Um, so we'll be back to do that in a minute. Now as a final touch, it's nice to sand a little um, bevel on the outside edges of your flange pieces. Um, just at the top outside edge, sand a little bevel on it. So when you go to attach your, um, set your motor cabinet on top, it'll um, slide down over the edge of the flange nicely and uh, easily and not, not just be catching on the edge of the flange. Okay, so there we are with our floorboards and our motor hatch, very nice snug fit. And um, that's all looking really good. Oh, the other, the other detail um, on this, uh, sort of the last detail, those little tabs break out really easily, um, which, <laughs> as you, you saw in putting them in, uh, getting them to stay in was the challenge, but uh, just making them break out uh, is not a problem at all. So um, break the little, the, your little retaining tabs that you had in there to hold the cedar in place. Just pop those off and you're done. Nice job. Okay, uh, we're going to get the veneer, uh, decorative veneer strips onto our onto our um, engine cover here. Um, the easiest way, there are a number of ways you can do it, uh, but this is a good way to do it. Um, just put the engine cover upside down onto a flat piece of paper. And essentially, I want the outline of the engine cover, but if I trace along with a pencil, I'll get um, a black pencil line onto the engine cover, and then I'll have to sand it off. So what I'm going to do is just make little cross hatch marks at the um, edge, lined up with the outside edge of the piece of the cover, and then I'll go by those cross hatch marks to draw straight lines, and I'll end up with something that's essentially the same as a tracing. Make these fairly precise. Don't have them too far in, or else your pieces of veneer won't. Uh, won't fit the cover. Um, okay, and then a good ruler and connect your lines. If your marks are a little bit too far out, your veneer pieces won't fit, but they'll be too big and you can trim them or sand them a little bit shorter. It's a bit of a nuisance. So, um, but it's better than having them too short to fit. So, if you're going to err, err on the side of them being a little bit too these marks being a little too far out. But it's easier if they're just exactly right. Okay, so there's our outline for the box. And now I'll show you what we're going to do here. I got it. It's probably easier if you square it with paper. I got mine a little bit no, not quite square. But that's okay. Okay, now um, 
you can measure your first piece and make it a little, you know, half an inch too long and uh, cut that off. Okay, now I've jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, cut all four sides uh, a little bit over length. Uh, each side is about a quarter of an inch long, uh, longer than it needs to be at each end. And now, and they're taped in place exactly with the outside edge of the veneer strip along my pencil lines. And um, not even a bad idea to check that at this point. Check the corners so you don't worry about the middle part if it's bowing out a little bit. That looks nice, uh, exactly lined up with the edges of my motor case. And that looks really nice too. So it looks like we're in good shape. Worth checking that. Okay, now the reason we're taped to a piece of paper like this is so we can move the paper to the edge. If you're cutting onto a, a flat board or something, that's fine. Or I have Formica on the table, I don't think I'll hurt it uh, because I'm not really going to be slicing. If you start sawing, slicing back and forth, you'll probably uh, split the veneer. So the goal is to just be able to push down on the knife hard enough that you make a perfect rabbit joint there. And that's just looking good. Did I get through? No, I might not have quite got through the second piece. Yeah, that should be through. There. And I don't know how well you can see that, but it's an absolutely perfect joint when you do it that way. Yeah, maybe you can see it up closer. Uh, which is it? It's this one right here. The light's not all that great, but it's a perfect rabbit joint that way. And um, so then turn your paper so you can do the next one. If you can't turn, if you if you have them taped to something you can't turn, you're not going to be able to get it to the edge of the table where you can actually push down and cut through both layers. Okay, I think we got that one. Yeah, there we go. Now a lot of uh, craftsmanship really isn't necessarily skill, it's just knowing that without good light uh, you're not going to be able to do a good job. Um, and if you need reading glasses that's a good that's a good help too so you can see precisely what you're doing. And then just having good techniques where it makes it easy. It's hard to do a rabbit joint exactly and have the pieces come out the right length but um, doing it this way uh, kind of guarantees that it's going to be perfect. Okay, so there are rabbit joints. Rabbit joints are a little bit harder than square joints, of course. But let's go ahead and do our square joints too. And I think we have two cross pieces on here. Um, so we can measure those and cut those. So we can cut those right in place here too. If the veneer has any um, rough places on it, just uh, clean those up with sandpaper. Okay, there's our first cut. Whoops. Make sure you cut all the way through. There. And our second cut here. Now, the, these veneer pieces aren't taped here, so I'm lining them up pretty carefully with my pencil lines, or else I won't get the right length on this piece that I'm working on now. Okay, you can see how that's going to go. And um, so now we've got our top piece almost ready. And uh, so we'll untape that and then we'll CA that onto the uh, top of the motor cabinet. And I'll show you how that's going to go. Okay, probably your motor cabinet is perfectly square, uh, 90 degree corners. However, um, if, it's, uh, if it's not, remember that when you did it, you had it laid upside down. So the far side piece should fit on this side here. Um, so rather than find out if my cabinet is perfectly square, I'm going to put that piece where I measured it. Right there. So that'll be on there. This piece will flip over here. And um, that's probably all I want to have on there right now. And uh, let's see how that's going to fit. That looks pretty good. Um, 
these pieces it's okay if they hang out over the edge just a teensy bit which looks like what I've got because we're gonna have veneer on the edge uh, right up to them as well so um, so it's kind of nice if they hang out a little bit uh, and that looks good so we will go ahead and put our CA on there and we're gonna spritz the cabinet instead of the piece that gives you a little bit until you get the piece down your veneer piece down against the cabinet your uh, accelerator isn't uh, accelerating but once you touch the cabinet then it starts to accelerate the piece the CA okay you don't want a whole lot of stuff squeezing out on both sides so uh, it's a little hard to do this in a steady hand as, as steady as I'd like but I'm trying to go down the center of this piece with one speed with the idea that it will squeeze out to the sides adequately without having so much such a heavy dose. If you get a heavy heavy accumulation someplace, you might want to spread that along. And if you if you're light someplace, no, that's probably not good either. So and if you see it all soaking in, so there's nothing left on the surface, that's not good uh, because you won't have you'll have a dry joint. And it's not going to hold. Okay. Yeah, I had quite a bit of soaking in here. So let's get a bit more on here. Remember, it'll soak into the other side, the motor cabinet side, too. Okay. It's, it should use the reflected light always. You can't tell anything without reflected light. Uh, yeah, we keep getting soaking in here. Um, different pieces of veneer will be act differently, of course. Wood is pretty variable. Okay, and that was on this side, so I'll spritz this side here all the way along. And then flip this over and get it on there quickly. Yeah, that's we only have a few seconds here. Well, that looks pretty good. I could have gone out, out over the edge just a little bit farther, but I'm, I'm happy with where it is. That's nice. Okay, and the short piece is a little bit easier. Get the mitered corner in first, get that right. Okay, and then the long piece along the other edge. Remember, uh, don't don't CA the wrong side of these pieces. That's not going to work. I'm doing a little heavier because I had quite a bit of soaking in on the other side with my first bead being so light. Okay, and spritz the cabinet. Nice. This is a little bit long at this end. Um, let's go ahead and trim that off. And we should be able to trim it in place adequately well. piece. Here's, here's our last piece. Let's fit this and make sure we're happy with it. Well, I think that's pretty perfect. Perfect is as good as we can get. So CA on first and then we'll spritz it. Another easy place to glue your fingers in on to the boat. There. 
Oh, you can see how uh, well that looks. There's a little light on it. No, I probably should have had the light on it when I was working on it. Um, and uh, that's going to be quite elegant. Uh, and now our cross piece, cross pieces across the middle. Let's check there. Let's check their measurement. Uh, make sure that hasn't changed. That's well, yeah, that's perfect. Exactly right. And this one again, perfect. Okay, and then for placement, it'd be nice if they're evenly spaced. So let's do a little uh, calculations here. Um, I think we want them evenly spaced. We want each division to be even. So um, let's try it this way. So that's 10 and 1 eighth. So if we went 3 and a quarter, centered at 3 and a quarter, let's see how that plays out. And this one centered at 3 and a quarter. Then we have 3 and a half. So let's go 3 and 3 eighths. So uh, 3 and 3 eighths. 3 and 3 eighths is going to be down here. 3 and 3 eighths. And now we have 3 and 3 eighths. So um, starting at the inside edge of the end piece, 3 and 3 eighths to the center of this piece, inside edge of this end piece, 3 and 3 eighths to the center of this piece, and then these two pieces center to center are 3 and 3 eighths. So that works really well. This piece has a little bit of roughness on this side, but if I move it, I won't know where I'm supposed to put it, will I? Um, so I'll make a teensy little pencil mark. Maybe I'll make it up on the edge because I can sand that off. Okay, and same here. Okay, and I'm going to sand off a little bit of roughness with the 220 grit sandpaper. So we'll have a clean edge. And there we go. Okay, and then we'll CA and spritz this. And we'll spritz the cabinet again instead of the piece. A little, little hair is sticking off the edge of that one. Once these are on, it's going to be a little hard to sand the edges, so clean up the edges before you glue them on. I mean, try not to change the shape of them, just try to get the edges so they not don't have any little filaments coming off them. Now look from straight ahead, straight above, get that square. It's not going to look so good if it's not square. Yep, see. <laughs> Don't have much time to adjust it though. That looks pretty good. Might might not be a bad idea to make a mark on both sides actually. I think I got that one on looking square. But uh it was partly luck. So if you have a square or you can just measure up each side, uh the same distance up each side. Okay, now I'll mark on each side. That'll that'll make it a little bit easier on this next one. Not quite so much guesswork. If you want to give yourself more time, you can do it without any accelerator, but it does take a surprising amount of time without the accelerator. And you have to hold it all that time or make sure it stays in place at least. And I just have a little drop We'll see I get on there, so I'll take that off. I don't sand it so much. Uh, there, isn't that nice? And when it's varnished, she'll be gorgeous. Okay, and then on the sides, we're gonna, I'll let you work on this, but we're gonna put an edge strip along the, each side, uh, right up now flush with the top strip or up underneath it, either way, it doesn't really matter. And, um, then uh, from there, you yeah, know, that may be enough, or maybe you want to bring strips down, um, even a strip along the bottom edge. Um, we'll 
give you a little guidance on that in a minute here when we decide. Okay, we've done the almost the whole cabinet now, and uh, we did do the whole the whole routine, uh, and it's fun to do and doesn't take uh, it's a little little fiddly pieces, but um, doesn't take very long and it turns out just gorgeous. So we did top and bottom strips on the sides, and then the three lined up with the top strips. Um, the three side pieces lined up with the top strips, and the end end cap pieces. And then on the ends, we did the same thing: boxed in bottom pieces first, and then fit the side pieces, the uh, vertical pieces in between the bottom pieces. I just wanted to show you one technique um, here on the uh, bottom piece. And uh, the last piece, last piece we have to fit. Um, if you put it in place, you have a square end. You put it in place uh, so it's butted right up to where it's going to sit. Then the most accurate way to mark it is with the knife blade. It's much, much more accurate than with a pencil. Once you get a a little bit of a notch in it with the knife blade, I don't think you'll be able to see it. It's hard to see. Then you can cut it with the knife blade on the edge of the table. I think if you try to cut everything right in place all the way through, you may have some troubles. Um, and then fit it, and that piece is just just the slightest teensy little bit too long. So then we'll take a little bit of sandpaper, 220. Otherwise, you probably split it if you use a coarser grit. Um, 220, and just touch it up a little bit, and there we are, perfect fit. Okay. So, um, and then, if you can figure out a way to do this job without getting CA on your fingers, let me know. Because uh, I don't know how to do it. But CA is not going to hurt you too much. So. And a little spritz, and then, oopsie, there we go again. And then get it in place very quickly, and then just hold it. And that's the last piece. Oh, uh, one other note though. Um, if in doing the long verticals, um, or the top and bottom pieces on the ends, if you get um, some extra CA squeezing out, uh, it's easier to sand that CA um, with the edge of a piece of sandpaper before you put on your uh, vertical pieces. Um, because you can sand all the way along. Once the vertical piece is on, uh, you can still sand it, but it's not quite as easy. Okay, so um, we're going to do a little more sanding, get some of the CA dots off, and um, and then sand the edges just a little bit to ease everything, and um, it'll be ready to varnish. And that is an elegant Edwardian motor launch uh, motor cover. That, that will look gorgeous. So, um, a uh, fun project, and, um, and really not difficult. Uh, the big thing is just positioning the pieces quite quickly. If you want to have more time, don't use any accelerator, but, um, but you'll be surprised that it does take, you can test and experiment, but you'll be, I think, surprised that it does take as long to set up as it does without the accelerator. So it does take quite a bit longer to do the project. Um, Great. Well, terrific. That was that was a fun project, and and when when it's uh, sanded out a little bit and varnished, it's going to be absolutely splendid. Super. Uh, next project is going to be um, coming up here soon. Um, so stay tuned.